It's a great privilege to be here. I've never been to this campus before, so it's a real treat. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm going to do quite a short reading, I think, from my novel, A Kind of Eden, which came out in, um, in England last July. And I'll give you a little bit of background to the, to, from where I pick up the, the story. It's a story told from the point of view of an English policeman who's been working in Trinidad with the SORT officers. And he has been here for some time and has fallen in love with Trinidad, fallen in love with a woman and wants to stay here to start a new life. Meanwhile, he has a wife in England who has just arrived with their 15-year-old daughter and he is in Tobago, in Mount Irvin, where they've rented a house. This is day one. So, Miriam is his wife, um, his name is Martin, Georgia is his daughter, and his girlfriend is called Sapphire. Okay. Miriam has her towels stretched out below the clump of rocks and she's sitting up, watching Georgia in the sea. She's wearing a striped bikini. He's never seen it before. He notices that her stomach is surprisingly flat. There's been a lot of talk of stomachs today. <laughs> okay, it's almost hollow. Her weight loss is obvious now. He hasn't seen her this skinny since they met. She looks as if she's already caught the sun. Her pale skin is turning pink. Pelicans dive near Georgia, plunging the water for fish, and she thinks this is hilarious. I'm gonna get abducted by a pelican, she shouts. Help me, Dad! She's bobbing up and down, holding on to the purple foam noodle she must have picked up from the storeroom. He stands at the edge where the sand is grainy. The warm water licks around his ankles. It feels good. Help me! Georgia feigns distress. Pelicans are large, prehistoric-looking creatures. He has never seen one quite so close up, like this, right there, circling in the middle of the bay, and then crash! The enormous bird plummets like an aircraft into the sea, and then it reappears, its beak clacking with wriggling fish. Amazing, he says. Isn't that something else? Miriam is inspecting her toenails. Are you going in? Not yet. I don't want to get all sandy, she says. He'd forgotten that about his wife, her aversion to sand. When they'd not long met, they drove to Crosby Beach ran down to the sea, took off their shoes and socks and paddled in the water. It was cold and rain was coming. Once her feet were wet, Miriam refused to walk back. At first he thought he was, she was joking, but then he realized that she was serious. She insisted that he carry her over the sand to the car, which he did. He remembers finding it strange. On holidays abroad, she always preferred a swimming pool. It's easy, concrete surround, especially for sunbathing on lounges. But surely, this could be an exception, this white Caribbean sand. It's a good spot, he says, isn't it? The house, the beach. Yes, she says. Could you put some cream on my back? She flops onto her stomach and adjusts her bikini bottoms. He stoops over her, squeezes the orange tube and the cream plops onto his hand. He smears it onto her shoulders, down over her back. Her legs are short and her veins stand out like electric blue lines. For as long as he's known her, she's hated her legs. If he's honest, he's never much like them either. Her ankles are thick and her thighs are soft like luncheon meat. Her upper body was always her best asset. Her neat back, round breasts, cinched waist. His mother used to say, you're either an apple or a pear. And Miriam is most definitely a pear. Sapphire is also a pear, but she's taller, more streamlined. You can bring a towel, she says, and lie here too if you want but he doesn't want. The water is deliciously cool and he swims fiercely towards his daughter as if he's trying to save her from something. He ducks under, swims quickly through her legs and lifts her up over his shoulders. Georgia screams and at once topples backwards and splashes hard into the water. Now she reaches onto his back and clings there. He can feel her breath on his neck. Come on, Dad, I'm tired. Take us back to the shore. He flips her off and there's a lot of shrieking and squealing. He can see Miriam sitting up watching, her hand a visor in the sun. Georgia waves at her mother, save me! They swim further along, keeping close to the land and paddle around the curve of the bay. 
on the other side of the rocks, it's difficult to see what lies ahead. The water feels cooler here. It is a darker blue. In the distance, he can see a couple of rickety wooden houses perched on the hillside. That must be the start of the village. They swim a little further to where the beach seems to rise into a sandy bank. He can see a sea grape tree, but not much else. He calls behind to Georgia. Shall we? They climb out of the water and walk slowly up the slope. Between a cluster of pools is a pearl, pool of turquoise water like a pond. There are tiny white crabs crawling here in the crevices. Georgia sticks her foot in the water. It's warm, she says, her eyes wide. She wants to jump in, but he says they should carry on and see what's ahead. They pass around the side of a large rock to where there's a clearing. Above and to the right in the shadowy light, he sees a broken set of steps and the branches of the tall trees marked with a cross. He knows what this means. They are mansionial trees. Their sap is like acid. He tells Georgia to stay clear. There is a tangle of bushes here and some long grass. This is amazing, Georgia says, and her blonde hair is blown back from her face. Better, better than Blanche shares, he thinks. How can that be? He wishes Sophia was with them. Has she been to this beach? He will bring her some day. They stare in silence. He thinks, we are nothing. Those waves could pick us up and hurl us against the rocks like matchsticks. And yet, we're not separate from nature. We're not without power. Sophia would say that we have the same power, the force of the waves within. She'd call it God. He's not so sure. Mum would love this, Georgia says. We've got to show her. I wonder if there's a way to get here without swimming. Ahead, about halfway down, he can make out a line of figures. A few are wading in the water. It looks as if they're pulling a net. He's seen this kind of fishing before with Sophia at sunset on Store Bay. He'd made a joke about giving up his job for a simple life as a fisherman. Sophia said, there's nothing simple about these fishermen. Like you, they work hard to feed their families. Just because they're poor, it doesn't mean they're simple. And he remembers feeling embarrassed and irritated and fixing his eyes on the busy scene, the young men packing fish into styrofoam boxes and carrying them on, the, on their heads to the road. I'm going to leave it there. Thank you.